Good afternoon and uh, good morning, good evening. Welcome again to another Bicon webcast. Today's program is going to take you through the journey that will get us from an edential space to a restored tooth. Granted, it won't be on the same patient, obviously, but it will be uh, showing us how we place an implant. In this case, it will be a one-stage implant. Uh, the tooth, as you uh, will see shortly on the radiograph as well as clinically, has been removed about six uh, weeks ago. So there isn't complete bone formation. However, there is epithelialization of the area. After the placement of the implant, we will carry to an uncovering of an implant. The uncovering will be reminiscent of the implant that we did at our last webcast on February 18th, which you can also see online at bicon.com. At that webcast, we placed a um, uh, Bicon 6x5 millimeter implant. And finally, we'll be inserting the restoration. So again, welcome, and let me introduce Dr. Vincent Morgan, a general dentist. Uh, and uh, my name is Shadi Daher. I'm an oral surgeon. Uh, and we together will provide you with today's uh, uh, program. Can we please have the uh, radiograph? You see that uh, the uh, two uh, bicuspids are uh, present. The uh, uh, molar, is, uh, as you can see, it's the shadow of the socket still remaining. And if you look closely, without really reading too much into the radiograph, the uh, shadow of the soft tissue is obviously uh, a little bit irregular. And this will be actually, will translate clinically. And so we will uh, be placing a Bicon short implant with a one-stage technique. In other words, a, a part, a, a healing abutment will be visible through the gingiva, will allow for healing, and uh, it will make the second procedure of taking the impression um, much uh, faster and uh, to be also uh, easy on the patient in that rarely will you need a uh, uh, local anesthetic for the area. You can, you can easily uh, see the kind of defect we are dealing with. And as you can all imagine, we have uh, basically no grafting in the area. The sinus, as you recall from the radiograph, is not near uh, the area. We'll make an incision that will allow us to close over should we decide that a one-stage procedure is not uh, optimal at this point. However, because of the lack of complete epithelialization and because we can see easily that the socket and the uh, uh, bone is, should be adequate for all intents and purposes, what I'm going to do is sort of a, uh, just a core, a, uh, akin to a punch uh, flap. Now, since we don't have full epithelialization, this will be considered an immediate placement. We waited not enough time for either bone regeneration or full epithelialization. So we will consider this an immediate post-extraction placement. Okay. So we take a soft tissue rounder after having made the uh, incision sort of circular around the perimeter of the socket. And we will remove all of this friable uh, pre-epithelium type of soft tissue or un not completely keratinized epithelium. And we will go ahead and remove any remnants that may be too mobile, because what we ultimately want to feel is a uh, kind of bone contact, you see? You can see now how we sort of freshened the, the socket. We are, have made it uh, circular. That will be uh, a lot easier to fit with a, um, a healing abutment. So in the Bicon system, you can have a, a comprehensive surgical kit or an advanced surgical kit. So the um, advanced surgical kit will contain a lot of uh, uh, instruments. However, the instrument that we have is, uh, oh, excuse me, the instrument that we have available in that kit are all essential for 
uh, the placement of different techniques of the Bicon implant. So if you intend to use the Bicon implant, uh, implant to its fullest, I think this kit is absolutely essential. Now, looking uh, in rows, you see the coloring and the banding on these uh, instruments. First, the color carries through and we will um, have the standard length, 2.5 all the way up to 6, and the banding, the black color, um, is between 6 and 8 for the first band and 11 and 14 for the second band. These are latch type primers. The colors, the gold or light blue, dark blue, pink, etc., are also um, carried through the kit. So whenever you have a 2.5 millimeter instrument, you will have the same coloring. Whenever it's a 4, again, the same pink coloring, etc. So um, the other instruments at the top of the uh, screen are the handles. These allow you to use hand instrumentation, which is one of the big features of the implant and the implant kit, because right with, um, with any implant, as you will see, we have that possibility, which gives you greater control and more meticulous reaming for, uh, to obey sort of what the, uh, the bone is telling you. And so looking at the pilot drill, when we rotate at 1100 RPM or so, you can easily see those uh, bands. Now, because we are rotating at such a high speed, we will obviously uh, risk uh, trauma, thermal trauma to the bone, so we do irrigate. Uh, so if we were to go in this direction, okay, if we had to use hand dreamers, we wouldn't be able to because they will come in a direct collision course with the mandible. So for that reason, and because the implant allows us that latitude, we're able to angle ever so slightly, roughly 10 degrees or so, and we're able to then because of that angulation, we're still within the confines of the occlusion and the crowns of the intended teeth, but at the same time, we're able to avoid the interference of the mandible. The other pilot drill is slightly longer. Now, when we're engaging the bone, irrigation and suction, please, we may sometimes have interference from uh, the crown of a tooth or when one able, I like to use the longer one because it gives me a better indication of my direction. Placement of the pilot drill. Let's talk about the depth of placement for a moment. The Bicon implant needs to be, at the very least, within the bone. So first we need to know where, where the bone is. And so when we look and we use a perio probe and we can measure the depth of the bone, and in this case, it's roughly five millimeters or almost six on the palatal, slightly higher on the distal, buccal, and of course, a lot higher on the mesial. Now, if we were to place this implant at the crest of the bone on the palatal aspect, it will put it within two or three millimeters on the other uh, sides of this uh, osteotomy, which is perfectly acceptable. Now we will look at our pilot hole. Now you can see the position, okay? So this was angled and yet looking right down at it, it doesn't look so angled, okay? The other aspect of the, of the Bicon technique is the use of very slow reaming. The reason we use slow reaming is that we will then avoid the need for irrigation. We certainly will avoid uh, thermal trauma since this is, w this is well below the threshold for that. It's about 50 RPM. And as you can see with these, they are um, uh, marked at the same banding as the pilot drill, 6 to 8 and 11 to 14, okay? So what I'll do is I'll find the mouth of the osteotomy and then I'll push it in, okay? In this case, we are not going to find a lot of bone. We didn't expect that, but it will help us now as we get wider, we will get to the proper level, okay? And again, one by one, we will carry our osteotomy to the proper depth. Keeping the index finger against the buccal plate allows you to have a tactile sense of where your implant is going. Uh, the initial, when I penetrated with this reamer, the initial uh, start went into the buccal, uh, or excuse me, the socket of the buccal root. 
and I'm going into the pyramidal bone between the three roots. Now, uh, that gives me better stability, and I'm starting to see a little bit of bone, even at three millimeter diameter level. And again, you see at very slow speed, always start before you engage the bone, and then, okay, you can also palpate the palatal, and that's one other advantage of the slow reaming, is that by palpating, you get a significant warning, okay, of uh, about a millimeter before you fenestrate or perforate. You can see that there is some bone shavings or maybe remnants of the osteoid or the scar forming in the socket. Okay, so we will remove that. Again, we will continue. It still has a tendency to want to slip into one of the sockets more than the osteotomy. So always pay attention. Once we reach the 4 to 4.5, this will be uh, a lot less likely. Okay. And the reamers have the added advantage in that they do not drill. They bottom out in the osteotomy, and unless the bone is extremely soft or you have a bottomless osteotomy, or um, you know, you're, you're touching a soft tissue of some sort, you will be stopped. This is a 4.5 millimeter reamer. Now you see it's engaging more walls. It's wobbling for a little bit until it engages the full parallel wall of the osteotomy. Okay, again, we are getting bone. We're going to make sure that our walls are intact, and they are. And some, because of also the spaces in the extraction socket, we uh, uh, have to you know, go fishing for a little bit of the escaped bone. So this is a hand reamer. This is a five millimeter. Has the gold coloring of another, uh, you know, of the latch reamer. Maybe, okay, you can see them, but they're reflecting the light a little bit too much. Okay, but the only difference is the hand reamer cuts on only one side. So if you look right down the barrel of the reamer, so to speak, you will see that it only cuts in one surface. There's another advantage in that the reamer has a little offset at the tip. That offset allows you, with a bit of pressure, to deepen your osteotomy if you have any need. But more importantly, it allows you to make it deeper very, very slowly. So let's say you're working near the sinus mucosa and or near the mandibular canal. You can get very close to either of those two structures. Now. If you zoom out, you can see how we're able to use this reamer by hand. Okay, I will show you the osteotomy in a minute. Turn slightly to the left, and we get to the full depth that we want to. And this actually compresses the bone, so when it cuts it, it cuts a significant amount. So we'll go to 5.5 millimeter uh, uh, reamer, and again, we'll do that by hand. You gotta find the mouth of the osteotomy, engage it, and start. Now you'll feel that there's a little bit, or a lot more resistance. It's a heavier contact. It is a wider diameter. It is also uh, going to be traveling, although it's the same speed. My, my turning of my hand is the same angular speed, but it's a bigger uh, distance, slightly, significantly nevertheless. Okay, and you notice how much bone we're collecting. We're collecting all of the bone out of these flutes, so we're emptying it out into this silicone dappin dish. Check any, for any weaknesses before you go to the final size, as you can cause, uh, you know, problem just trying to uh, just finish up your osteotomy. We're collecting quite a bit of bone. This is the Bicon depth gauge. It comes also with the kit. It has a flat and sharp bottom, so you slide it uh, down the wall, either pal buccal, palatal, whichever one you want to measure. In this case, because the palatal was the shallowest of them, I'm more, most interested in, in the depth of the osteotomy there. The first line is at 6 millimeters, the second line is at 8 millimeters, then 11, then 14. Right on the palatal tissues, we're right about 14, okay, and that's where we want the implant to be within the bone. This is the crucial step where we want to have integrity of the walls and we push 
if you twist only or twist and push very little, you will be carving out all of the, uh, the walls. If you push harder and twist uh, slowly, you will be expanding the weaker walls, which is the best way to protect when you don't have a widely open flap, you see? So as I'm pushing, I'm twisting kind of slowly, and I'm pushing pretty hard. You know, our patient can probably attest to that. So we are now finished with the osteotomy. That's our osteotomy. You can see the walls almost. Actually, better than I can see them. The implant that's going to go into this osteotomy is a 6 millimeter by 8 millimeter short implant. The Bicon implant comes triply sterilized. The package that you see on the screen now, it comes the, uh, the, the cardboard and the blister pack are packed in a plastic bag. The cardboard and the blister pack are sterilized. The blister pack further it ha contains a bag that contains the implant. That is also sterilized as well as the uh, implant. So, what we would like to now look at are some abutments and what we would like to use is an abutment that allows us flexibility in the placement depth and, and it has the size. So if you remember, the soft tissue depth on the palatal is 5 millimeters. So we have these options. We either place it below the soft tissue or above the soft tissue. My preference is to go with the longer one because the soft tissues on the buckle are slightly higher and a difference of about a millimeter to a millimeter and a half, as long as we instruct our patients not to play with the abutment with their tongue or chew on it, it will give us primary stability, will not cause macro movement of the implant, and we're able to do it that way. Couple the abutment and the implant, make them as a one unit, carry the both of them together, place them and seat them fully, thereby creating a sort of a one-stage implant with a healing abutment. Now we have an implant that is one stage and you may have to use a little bit of twisting in there to just make sure it goes in the proper osteotomy. Okay. Now it's a friction fit implant so we will push it to seat as much as possible. We will use a seating tip that is as wide as the top of this abutment, or well, actually this is a slightly narrower, but it will still work. And that comes also in the kit. We can take this, uh, now it's, the osteotomy is gonna guide it in. So we'll just give it a couple of taps, because we want it to be just, and you can hear the difference in the, the tone. The uh, post-op radiograph, as you can see, this is a one-stage implant filling our osteotomy with primary stability and plenty of bone contact. This is an implant that was placed with an internal lift and it was six millimeter wide, five millimeter long and uh, it's placed as a two-stage implant. Uh, however, it does have a uh, metal uh, abutment and that's called the sinus lift temporary abutment which is covered with the soft tissues entirely. Now um, obviously you want to preserve the buccal soft tissues and we initially start with just the crestal incision. Okay. Now the uh, retractor always gets in the way of making that, this incision uh, with a um, pr protection of the papilla. However, it is not going to be at all crucial. So it will be curved appropriately before we proceed. The best way to um, open a crestal incision is with Dean scissors and using a blunt dissection technique. So we will introduce the scissors into the incision and spread them and then close them outside and then push back in until we've expanded the whole incision. I will show you now how that works. You can see it actually. So now using a Pritchard periosteal 
elevator. We'll use the uh, narrower end so we can also elevate more of the soft tissues to get around the entirety of the sinus lift abutment. And we can now take a good view of it. My preference is to always maintain as um, small and flap as possible. It causes less pain. And that's the abutment. We will take a guide pin, which will fit snugly in the uh, implant well. We will place it and check integration. I'm moving the entire head with that. There is no micro movement. There is no perceptible movement of this implant, which has correlated uh, in our uh, clinic with uh, appropriate numbers on the perio test. In this case, what we will do is take an implant level impression, and that's very simple to do. Now, because there will be an impression taken, I will place a buried suture. Basically, the knot is inside the tissues. So instead of going from the buccal to the center and then from the center to the palatal, we'll go from the center to the palatal, then from the buccal to the center or to the incision, and then we will tie the knot. When we release and cut the knot, it will pull into the uh, incision space. I will now turn it over to Dr. Morgan, who is a general dentist, who will now restore it. Thank you, Dr. Daher. And that's it. Although you can take impressions of the Bicon uh, implant directly on an abutment if it were tapped in, alternatively with an acrylic sleeve snapped onto the abutment. However, our preference is the implant level impression. I would advise all of you that it is probably the most effective way and certainly the most cost effective way of doing it because the dentist needn't have an inventory of components. Impression is just about set or we'll remove it. The acrylic sleeve should remain in the impression and to remove the color, green color three millimeter impression post, simply remove it. And now, since it's a non-aesthetic area, we're not concerned about restoring it at this time. We'll simply put in a white healing abutment. It's nothing more than a round peg into a round hole. Slight tap. What you want to be cognizant of in placing these abutments is that you allow sufficient room for the interproximal papilla. It's better to err on the, size of a, on the side of a smaller diameter abutment than a larger. You do not want to encroach upon the space of the papilla and it, additionally you do not want to have it too far facially or buccally. So if you're going to err, err on the side of a smaller abutment. So there's a, a short bicon abutment, or an implant rather. The patient has the anesthesia. Now it's just a matter of locating the, the well of the implant. That, and I'm going to use the back side of a, a guide pin. It's clearly there. The post is cleaned with, with alcohol. And if all goes well, it will be just a matter of inserting it and being done with it. We will most likely use a relieving incision since the soft tissue has closed in on us. But close, light down, open, close, light down, close firmly. You can see the blanching of the tissues, open, which is Oddly enough, not interfering. So we contact is present immediately. Contact is present distally. First thing we will do is check the occlusion on the opposing side, make sure that it is in occlusion. Close. There's contact on the opposing 
side, open. Now let's see if it is in fact in occlusion or whether it's hypo-occlusion. Close, oh. tap, 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 open. Probably a little, little heavy because it's on that palatal cusp. It was still blanching because of the fact that there was no, um, no temporary abutment in place. We may make a little relieving incision. Just a, that's it. Maxillary anteriors you'd want to tap. However, in the post area, just having your patient close on a, a Q-tip is sufficient. And there it is. How does that feel? A little high. A little high, okay. Then, let's check and see if it's closed. They closed. It can't be too high, but so we'll make a little adjustment. And the beauty of these indirect composites is the fact that you can adjust them and polish them uh, completely in the mouth. Close. Tap, tap, tap. Open. Feel better? Still uncomfortable? No, it's okay. It's okay. Let's just polish that little adjustment that we made with a, a finishing burr. Okay. okay. The key to the integrated abutment crown radiographically to evaluate it is that it has a hemispherical base. The, as you can see, the hemispherical base, the titanium, is in contact with the bone and not the indirect composite. My comments on that is uh, if you don't see, open a wider flap. Whenever in doubt, there's nothing better than so-called cold steel and sunshine. You gotta open it, you gotta see it, you gotta do what is absolutely necessary. Um, basically, since we are not drilling at high speed, we are not afraid of having uh, traumatized bone and, and sequestra of bone left behind. We don't irrigate the area. Uh, the only irrigant that's used is sterile water at the time of the pilot drill. Beside or beyond that, we do not irrigate the area. Uh, we correct it. We remove all lodge debris as they may interfere with the seating. However, it is not uh, it's not needed at all. In fact, it may be detrimental. That is an osteotomy that has been placed with no uh, irrigation whatsoever. It's been placed atraumatically. All of the cells in there, we dare think, are vital and viable. Why irrigate? We're washing them away. It is not necessary. The, the answer, in short, is why not? not. <laughs> why not? We, you saw the middle case where we had an area where a millimeter of native bone initially was expanded with an internal sinus lift. We placed a six by five millimeter implant and we're going to place a, a molar tooth on that. And it works in that, it, it's all grafted bone. Why wouldn't it work in native bone then? And clearly we have the, the case after case after case. We have the statistics, we have the research, there are papers published on that. The real question is, or the, the answer is why not? If it works in the worst type of bone, this is even better. It will work in that as well. The fact is all the research, all of our experience, and we are talking here uh, thousands of implants. We're talking uh, uh, two decades. We have implants uh, that are eight millimeters in length and those put us usually in crown to implant ratio at best of uh, one uh, and a half to one, uh, which is clearly in violation of all of what we were taught in, in prosthodontics. And, and uh, it has not affected our longevity, long-term success, crestal bone maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. And the paper uh, and, and the, uh, the, re the literature is available online if you go to bicon.com. What we are using are short implants for all our patients. The longest implant we are using is eight millimeter, and that's short implant by everybody's standard. 
And beyond that, we use 5.7, we use 6, we use 5 millimeter long implants. So we use them in all situations, whether we have 18 millimeters of bone or 8 millimeters of bone. And so what we are doing, what we are researching, what we are finding success, and uh, even in these uncertain times, is the short implant goes anywhere there is bone, a lot of bone or a little bone, we're able to, to uh, serve our patients. Well, I'd like to refer you to the previous webcast where we did quite a few um, sinus procedures. I uh, also would like to invite you to, uh, to uh, come to our um, short implant seminars that are going on um, frequently around the country and the world. Uh, the short answer is we've placed implants in as little as one millimeter of bone with select internal or crestal lifting techniques. And um, short of going into a whole lecture on the topic, which I can't right now, uh, I couldn't go into greater detail. But the short answer is one millimeter, select cases, experience, the appropriate wide implant, a plateau design implant, the Bicon implant will allow you to do that. Well, uh, this is an abutment that's, that's used exclusively for sinus lift to stabilize the uh, implant with the crestal bone. It is placed there not permanently, but rather temporarily, hence the name, sinus lift temporary abutment. The key is uh, to think of the one-stage surgery as the uncovering procedure for the implant. So, if you have an implant placed and you have the attached gingiva, you look at your attached gingiva, what you need is an aesthetic buckle, especially in the aesthetic zone, buckle, uh, keratinized attached gingiva. So the uh, decision tree after that becomes a little simpler. If you are making a, an opening to uncover an implant, preserve your attached gingiva. And that is the same flap that we use. Now, if you place that incision and open the flap and there are ends that are loose, they have to be sutured because they cause bleeding, they cause pain, they pump uh, the saliva and oral flora in and around the implant, etc., etc. So suturing is not a, uh, you know, boogeyman, is not scary. However, if you have a lot of attached gingiva, you can use a punch. My preference is to use a uh, 15 or a 15C blade and create a sort of elliptical incision, therefore creating weaker spots at the mesial and distal, and when stretching it, we don't cause tears in the buccal and uh, palatal uh, areas. And that will allow you to avoid suturing. First of all, the implant is not a polished cylindrical, um, you know, piece of metal. It has ridges, it has vertical slots cut in these plateaus so that you will be able to get an irregular fit between the implant and the osteotomy. Secondly, the bone is not granite, it's not marble, it is not metal. The bone is a living um, organ. It will flex away as we're reaming it, especially if it's the proper type 2 or 3 bone it will bend out of the way with the use of the proper bicon reamers. And so as you remove your last reamer, that minute or two or three it takes you to get to the next reamer, let's say, or usually to the implant, the bone actually bows back in, kind of flexes back. And when we introduce our implant, especially as you saw in this last one, uh, or the, the first case, excuse me, we had to actually tap the implant to seed it into that bone. That is how uh, tight the uh, osteotomy is against the, uh, the implant. So we don't need to thread it. We have not needed to thread it. It is the way it has been designed. The tips of the plateaus contact the bone. It may bend into the plateau space ever so slightly. The blood clots in the plateau spaces will, over time, become ossified by callus formation. It's fast. It's predictable, and it give you, gives you a, a, the best type of bone, which is the lamellar type, cortical type of bone. And again, we'll refer you to the website or to our lectures going around um, uh, the country and the world.
Short answer is no. In fact, even in this case, although we went toward the palatal, it was really more central. We went, we sort of split the difference between the buccal plate and the a palatal plate. The palatal root is obviously bigger, so you will have more of your osteotomy within the confines of the palatal root. Well, it's a very different scenario. Second bicuspids, the majority, if you remember from endo, majority of them have a single root. First bicuspids, that's about the maxilla, uh, of course. Uh, first bicuspids have a higher uh, likelihood of having two roots, a palatal and, and a, uh, a buccal. And so <clears throat> in both of these, my preference is to go in between the roots. And we, my preference is to do it immediately after extraction if I can uh, ensure there is no infective agents left in the socket um, and that we have the proper uh, provisional, etc. As for the molar, my preference, if there is adequate bone in the interradicular space to place the implant in that area, parts of the uh, implant may uh, sort of bulge into or burst into the um, uh, root uh, sockets. That is not an issue. The fact is now you decide either to place it as a single stage implant whereby the titanium of your abutment will obliterate the rest of the uh, socket opening or you place it as a two stage uh, implant whereby you place uh, some bone or little bone and some uh, hemostatic agent over usually a collagen plug uh, that will close over the area. It will get migration uh, of the soft tissues, obviously healing by secondary intention in, in a few days. Now, do we always go into the palatal? No. Sometimes you have to go slightly palatal. I demonstrated why that is the case. So there's nothing wrong with that. You just don't have an excuse to try to go 30 degrees uh, toward the palatal or 25 de degrees. You stay within 10 degrees. It has no effect, no bearing on the restoration, either from a restorative, purely restorative uh, standpoint or from an aesthetic standpoint. On behalf of all of our staff here, Dr. Morgan uh, and uh, all of our patients, I thank you for your attention and I uh, welcome you to our coming, upcoming uh, webcasts. Uh, also feel free to uh, go on the bicon.com website so that you may send us any further uh, questions and uh, or uh, you know comments. We always depend on your ability to feedback uh, so we can improve our programs uh, to you. Anything to add Dr. Morgan? No, other than the fact that the Bicon website is a wealth of information uh, even on the bridge splitting techniques. Whatever you want to know about Bicon, I think you can find on uh, bicon.com. Thank you very much. Thank you and good night.